So, dear distinguished colleagues and guests, first of all, welcome. And I am very delighted to host um, this event today and to be here with you to discuss how to effectively combat wild trafficking and also strengthening the involvement of local communities and also indigenous people in the wildlife management and also conservation. And if you look around us, I think that um, uh, the, the, this event is representing what I am saying here by involving directly local communities, hearing from them directly and also uh, indigenous people. The illegal wildlife tra trade remains serious and also widespread. And that is why we need to take urgent actions. The serious nature of wildlife crime is well recognized in CITES and reflected in resolutions, in, deci in decisions, recommendations, declarations, and also statements which have been adopted at the highest levels. The EU is a key player here, a key player to fight against illegal wildlife trade. In 2002, the European Commission adopted a revised EU action plan against wildlife trafficking, which was built on previous EU action plan against wildlife trafficking covering the period 2016 and 2020. The reported value of the illegal wildlife trade in the EU was a minimum uh, of 4.7 million euros in, in 2019, but likely this number is much higher than that. I am particularly pleased to see the collective effort of intergovernmental organizations to combat wildlife crime, resulting in the formation of the International Consortium to Combat Wildlife Crime. Illegal wildlife is not only a driver of biodiversity loss, but also has devastating socio-economic consequences as the destruction of ecosystems, which can result from trafficking, depriving also local communities of legitimate and also sustainable forms of income. Wildlife use and trade can contribute to the restoration of populations of endangered species. It does this by creating conservation initiatives for private individuals and also local communities. For instance, I can mention one very specific example, the Vicuna, Vicuna, Vicuna populations in the Andes recovered with the introduction of life sharing by local communities for the luxury fiber trade. The agenda on the, of this conference therefore looks extremely interesting. And I would like to thank all the speakers who are attending for this event. And also I would like to thank FACE for also taking the initiative, the collective initiative of organizing this very timely uh, event and also of sending a very strong message out there. Before giving the floor to the knowledgeable speakers, I would like to wish you honorable guests a fruitful, constructive, and also a positive debate. And now I would like to give the floor to the European Commission rep representative, Mr. Rodriguez Romero. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon, uh, everyone. And I would like to thank all the uh, organizers and uh, our host for inviting me to uh, present uh, the uh, EU Action Plan Against Wildlife Trafficking. Uh, I think I have a few slides to accompany my presentation, uh, but actually your introduction has made my, my life easier because uh, in the first slide I was trying to convey how important is the, the fight against uh, wildlife trafficking. And you have very eloquently um, referred to it, but not, not only by the impacts on biodiversity loss, but also the destructive socioeconomic impacts that illegal wildlife trade has. And that's a, an angle and an important uh, highlight that I, I would make. It uh, undermines the rule of law. Uh, it, um, it is usually or often linked to other forms of organized crime and is a very lucrative, uh, low risk, high reward um, um, crime. So uh, that's my first um, slide, uh, and uh, I will uh, skip it. And just to give you a bit of international context, you uh, 
may be aware, there is the Convention on International Trade in, in Endangered Species, uh, CITES, which is a global convention uh, that has um, already 50 years. And we have recently, in, 2000, uh, in 2022, November, attended the Conference of the Parties, the 19th Conference of the Parties of, uh, of CITES, with uh, a lot of progress in protecting endangered species in, and to uh, ensure that there is a global framework for legal and sustainable trade in, uh, in endangered species. So the COP19 adopted proposals regulating international trade in, uh, in more than additional 500 species. But it also took very important steps to uh, or continue working on, uh, on the fight against uh, wildlife trafficking and enforcing the existing rules and uh, fostering global partnerships. So uh, after, shortly after the uh, Conference of the Parties in Panama of the CITES Convention, there was also the Conference of the Parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity in Montreal, uh, the CBD that took uh, a very important step in agreeing uh, the, a global biodiversity framework that will guide uh, the global action uh, against biodiversity loss and uh, fostering uh, biodiversity uh, restoration. And there are a number of targets that were agreed globally by the parties of the CBD that are directly relevant to, uh, to wildlife. Uh, mentioned in, in, in the slide. I just wanted to give a bit of uh, this uh, framework of international action in which we are, we are uh, working. So why an action plan? It, was, um, it is clear since uh, many years that the EU has to take responsibility as a global hub for trafficking wildlife. It is uh, a transit uh, um, a spot on, on wildlife trafficking. It is also even uh, a source of wildlife trafficking. If we think, for example, of uh, glass eels, which are harvested and exported illegally from uh, the EU with uh, high profits. The EU um, Action Plan Against Wildlife Trafficking provides a comprehensive framework, bringing together all aspects and uh, angles on the fight against wildlife trafficking. Because we are using... Uh, a wide range of tools to fight wildlife trafficking. Just to mention a few, we are using trade policy. We have uh, chapters on trade and sustainable development in our free trade agreements where we have uh, commitments with, uh, with our partners on this matter. We have uh, large programs like Nature Africa in uh, uh, in which promote, uh, financed by the EU, promote um, uh, a, a landscape approach uh, for conservation, development, and governance, but also covering uh, the fight against poaching and the strengthen of, of the rule of law and of the legislation and enforcement. Uh, we have the new environmental crime uh, directive, a proposal that is being uh, discussed at the moment by the institutions that will make a, a a uh, further step on promoting stricter sanctions on, on wildlife trafficking. We have the recent Digital Services Act, which also will uh, be an important tool to fight against the uh, online uh, illegal trade, on, on also on wildlife. We have a number of, of, of different uh, tools as well, the Corporate Sustainable Due Diligence, uh, proposal. I think all these tools uh, can help, and uh, what the EU Action Plan uh, does is brings together different tools from different stakeholders as well and different actors, not only the Commission and the EU, but also the EU member states, the stakeholders, and and partner countries to to bring uh, action together that is more effective about this uh, pervasive uh, problem. So. Um, I would like to give you an overview of the uh, EU Wildlife Action Plan. This doesn't seem to work now, but okay. Mm -hmm. I, will, um, I will just mention that um, the uh, new EU Action Plan was adopted. Now it was too fast. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, it was adopted just before the... Um, the Conference of the Parties of CITES on the 9th of, uh, 
of November, and the, the action plan is structured along four priorities, 17 objectives and 79 actions. So the priorities uh, are preventing wildlife trafficking and addressing its root causes. Uh, is, the second is strengthening the legal and uh, policy framework against wildlife trafficking. The third is enforcing regulations and policies to fight wildlife trafficking effectively. And the fourth is strengthening the global partnership of source, consumer, and transit countries against wildlife trafficking. So these are the, the four priorities uh, around which this uh, EU action plan is, uh, this updated action plan is, uh, is built. Of course, we, uh, we are building on experience of the previous action plan, which was adopted in 2016. And we are... Uh, taking a specific uh, look at or a specific emphasis on, uh, on issues that have become uh, more important or more challenging in the last uh, years, such as online uh, trade. Um, and uh, we have also a focus on increasing transparency on the action against uh, wildlife trafficking strength and cooperation with the stakeholders, including third countries, and uh, reinforcing the role of actors along the whole enfor uh, enforcement chain, uh, so including prosecutors uh, and, and judges and uh, police. So uh, because the focus of, of today, I wanted to uh, make a, a specific uh, mention of the importance of the engagement of indigenous indigenous peoples and local communities in the fight against wildlife trafficking. This has been very uh, clearly uh, highlighted by many uh, publications, but I, I mentioned here the latest on um, published by uh, IBES, the International Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which uh, made a, a report on sustainable wildlife uh, management highlighted the importance of uh, legal and sustainable trade for the well-being and livelihoods of, of many people around the, the globe. So many wild species are used for food, energy, medicine, materials, uh, through fishing, uh, logging, terrestrial animal harvesting, etc. The traditional knowledge and, and practice of local communities is really a, a very important piece in conservation and management of, of wildlife. And, uh, and it, it does play sustainable trade a very important role uh, as an incentive for conservation. Um, and this illegal wildlife trade, as I mentioned already, poses really a threat to this uh, to this uh, livelihoods. And the EU, the EU wildlife action plan um, has a number of elements uh, strengthening this uh, engagement and some areas of action. One is creating jobs and improving security and sustainable livelihoods while preserving critical ecosystems and wildlife. This is done by programs such as Natura Africa that I have uh, mentioned, and also by recognizing the positive role that uh, participation of local communities has in, in the uh, wildlife uh, management through community-based natural resource management, ensuring uh, free prior informed consent processes, effective grievance mechanisms, access to information, and promoting participation of women and, and young people. There is also the important uh, role in recognizing and acting on the nexus between wildlife, uh, illegal wildlife trade and security, uh, because uh, in order to promote the stability and rule of law. So um, I just want to finish my uh, intervention by stressing that really the, the success of the action plan is uh, it builds on the collective effort. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are actions that are uh, relying on many stakeholders and we have basically to build partnerships and to work together uh, to make this uh, fight against uh, wildlife trafficking uh, a successful endeavor. So thank you very much for your attention.
So thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Jorge Rodriguez Romero. Now we will be having a panel discussion um, being moderated by Mr. Michael Satz Rofles, who is a research associate at the University uh, of Oxford. Uh, with us for this panel discussion, uh, His Royal, um, uh, the Ambassador uh, of the United Republic of Tanzania to Belgium, uh, Yestas Abu Nyamanga, um, and Mr. Edward Van Esch, the ICCWC Coordination Coordinator Enforcement Unit, Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species and Wild Fauna and Flora. F Flora, site secretariat. So I would give the floor to our moderator now, Mr. Michael Sass Rolfes. The floor is yours. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for inviting me to here to moderate. Um, so how I'm going to proceed, I'm going to ask our two other distinguished guests to make a few remarks. I'm going to introduce them first. And then we have a third distinguished guest with us as well from Botswana, who's also been invited to make a few remarks. So um, we'll start off with um, His Excellency Justice Abuk Niamanga, the Ambassador of the United Republic of Tanzania to Belgium. Um, Ambassador Niamanga is a career diplomat who has served his country remarkably for over 20 years at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and abroad after beginning his diplomatic career in 1999 as third secretary in the foreign service of his country's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He then rose through the ranks of the diplomatic hierarchy to become Minister Plenipotentiary in 2013. Over the course of his career, he has held the posts of Head of Chancery at the Embassy of the United Republic of Tanzania in Cairo, Egypt, and Assistant Director at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Department of Regional Cooperation and Multilateral Cooperation, where he's, he was responsible for issues pertaining to international development cooperation. He has also served as coordinator in the office of the Chief Secretary of the President of the United Republic of Tanzania and Cabinet Assistant Secretary in the office of the President, with responsibility for matters relating to foreign affairs, defense, and security. Most recently, from April 2018, until his recent appointment as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to, of the United Republic of Tanzania, he held the post of Director of the Department of Europe and the Americas at his country's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and East African Cooperation. So I would like to invite you, um, Your Excellency, to, to uh, address a few remarks to us on your perspective of the EU Action Plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Michael. If you don't mind, I call you Michael. And I'm glad that you are also from Oxford University, as I used also to be a student from Oxford University. Uh, I would like also, before I move on, to also thank Mr. Saliba, Saliba and also commend Mr. Romeo for the remarks that he has given to us. Uh, I want really to appreciate you and appreciate this uh, opportunity of exchanging with you this evening. I recognize we have also my colleagues from Botswana, from South Africa, and also my delegation is there. Uh, I want to emphasize a few things before we go into details of the discussion. One is for Tanzania, conservation is a priority area. And we have been so since independence. It's among the few countries where 30% of our land is a reserved area, 30%. We have more than 300,000 kilometer squares of our land being set aside for conservations. Now, this is not a small piece of land. It equals the size of the old Germany. It is 10 times the size of Belgium. It is seven times the size of Switzerland. This is the area that we have sacrificed for the natural 
for the conservation, for the benefit, for the for the for the well-being of the globe. Not only the well-being of Tanzanians. We have a huge pressure of the population of about 61 million people. They need this area. But the government has said, no, we want to put this land aside. So whether talking about hunting or conservations, we are there. And I think there is no anyone who can come and tell us the sacrifice that we need to do, that our population has done to conserve, to make this area reserved for people. And, uh, and I want you, Excellencies, to understand that, that don't think of regarding saying maybe we don't put much emphasis on the conservations. That's the, 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 the one emphasis that I would like to, to, to make from the beginning. Then the other things which I would like to also to pinpoint is uh, sometimes there is some argument, people trying to link poaching and, uh, and, uh, and uh, trophy hunting in the, in the trade and uh, legal trading or, 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 or illegal trade. We are in the front line of poaching strategies, making efforts against poaching. It is just uh, this month we have launched a new strategy of national anti-poaching strategy 2023-2033. And uh, given this, what we are doing to make sure that we reserve, we deserve and we reserve, we protect the wildlife animals in Tanzania. Today, Tanzania, for the first or rank the first in terms of lion population. It is estimated, I'm saying it's estimated, uh, that worldwide, uh, worldwide there are around 24,000 lions. In Tanzania alone, we have a population of about 15,000 lions out of 24,000 lions worldwide because we are putting every effort against the poaching. And it goes also with other, 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 other types of uh, wildlife, including leopards. We have also, we are ranking also among the first countries for having a big population of leopards. Worldwide, they think maybe they're around, uh, they're around 12,000 leopards globally. More than 1,500 leopards are in Tanzania. That makes the total of about 10% of all leopards globally. So we are in the front line of any effort against poaching. So saying, uh, Trophy hunting is uh, accelerating poaching, will accelerate poachings in Tanzania, is similar to Botswana. Uh, uh, it's, not, it's not the fact. The other facts I want to also to, to emphasize here, excellencies and the honorable uh, MPs, is on the issue of uh, which I really thank you, Mr. Romero, that you have, Romero, that you have put it very clear also in EU action plan about the issue of community, the engagement of community, that our community, especially the local community, they are integral part of our conservation. Uh, and, uh, and that being the case, uh, all efforts that we are doing, we are making sure that communities are becoming in front line in our conservation processes. We have to know that wildlife conservation does not depend on national government's fiscals for financial support. Wildlife agencies are expected to raise enough financial resources and mobilize other resources on their own 
So whenever resource that they get, they use these resources back to make conservations sustainable. So any attempts of burning legal trade on the traffic, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the hunting trophies will in fact affect badly the revenue resources from our conservation uh, areas. For example, in Tanzania, for 10 years, 2012 until 2022, we, we have got amount of about 136 million US dollar collection from hunting trophies, which is going back. I'm glad you, are, you have said about the natural Africa, EU natural Africa. But Romeo, how much the fund for EU natural Africa? See, it's so small compared to what we need, what Zimbabwe needs, what Botswana needs, what Tanzania needs. Because if you have an area of 300,000 and you want to conserve it, you want to put it protected, you obviously need to have a big fund, big money. So this is something which we have to, to put into consideration. Our community are purely depending on uh, what comes out of our conservations. We all know that the world is now slowly recovering from the COVID-19. It is, it will be a big disappointment if at this point where natural, where tourism is trying to, to recover from the bad negative of the COVID, if we can make some restrictions again against the trade on the trophy on the, on the trophies which in, 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 in is obviously is going to affect very significantly our 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 economy but there is also something which i would like to to emphasize here honorable mps in today's world of 21st century we don't make decisions on emotions. We don't make decisions on uh, by seeing views of somebody who is maybe uh, writing on uh, on the news media. Or we make our decision based on scientific science. We have to be a scientific based organization, and uh, we are all adhering to the sites. That sites through sites. We have more than 38, I think now it's about 38 uh, uh, species, endangered species in, within, within the sites. You said in the, the meeting of Panama, we added 500. These are the only place that we all come together and they see the scientific evidences where, whether a certain species is in danger or not. And we have all adhering to the sites data. Last time, I think, uh, Mr. Romeo, we, you were here when we had a site secretary general in a meeting like this. It is very clear that these hunting trophies is not part of site endangered species. This is scientific improvement. So if it is not in part of sites, and this is the only place that we think is a scientific evidence, why are we based on views of false media, uh, individuals' views, somebody making a one a lions, and then making a photo of one lion, and then convincing everyone that, OK, because that lion has been killed, whether in the name of Cecilia or whichever the name, then, OK, now, because Cecilia has been killed, now let's burn all trophies. Is that the world we are living today in the 21st century? I don't think EU can make their argument based on those unscientific evidences. So my appeal to you, Excellencies, Honorable MPs, is that we have to bide on science. If anything mentioned on the science is approved science, then we Tanzanians <laughs> and the other African countries will be ready for that. 
But as of now, nothing is, has been approved as a part of the science. The other thing I would like to, now those being the case, uh, what should I be my, my, my appeal? Maybe quickly. Please ignore anything that is not science-based. That's why. Second, any attempt to ban hunting trophies will be regarded as a violation of human rights of our citizens, particularly our rural communities, whose their lives are sustainably are depending completely on these hunting trophies or money that come from uh, trophy huntings. Third, we are countries which are sovereign and there are our questions on managing the environment, managing resources, managing whether wild animal, whichever resources is unquestionable. I've told you how much we have sacrificed. So please, could you regard us as a sovereign in our life, life management decisions that we need, we have a rule, we have a role to take care on behalf of the world. And we have been taking care of these wildlife animals over the long times. Anything that need to come and that's going to affect, please, there should be a consultation as a friendly country, as a partners. There should not be a unilateral action taken by one to the other. The third, please, could we comply with the multilateralism? We all believe in multilateralism, that no one is better than all of us. And the one action in one area affects the other parts of the world. This is what the principle we all believe in. And that is what I would suggest that we uphold our multilateralism. We don't take unilateral actions. We do have SADC wildlife management. We have East Africa wildlife conservation issue. We have African Union also. Are you proposing that African Union, sh we should make our own decisions and the European Union make their own decisions and the SADC make their own decisions and every, I think the world will not be organized in that way because anything that will be taken as a decision of the European Union will also push for African Union to make the decision that is also might be against that one. And I think the world will not uh, move in a, in, a, in a harmony situation if each region is making their own decision depending on what suits them. So let's all come together and rely on what materialism material, material, uh, material is. Uh, any attempt to ban hunting trophies is going to disrupt our wildlife management program. We have several programs. Botswana, they have their program. South Africa, they have their program. Tanzania, we have our program, a long program. And the, all these programs depends on resources. So anything that is going to, probably is going to accelerate again poaching, is going to make no incentive for a community to take care and protect these areas. We have some blocks. And if we allow people now, these blocks might not be used in a proper way. And so we have to be also careful on that. Lastly, I think I will get more time to speak. I would like to appreciate you so much for the exchange. And I hope through this exchange, we are going to have a, a special or a different look on the issue. But I want to assure you that uh, please trust that we can take care of these wildlife conservations and we have been taking care of it and that we are still able to take care of it for the benefits of our global. We are sacrificing a lot for the human well-being. So please, there should be a way of at least admitting that we are sacrificing a lot 
So a little thing that we can get, let's get it, because it's not enough from what we are getting and what we are sacrificing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments, Excellency. I'm going to move straight to the next um, presentation, and I believe there is actually a, a presentation. It's going to be from Edward van Asch, who is the IQIC coordinator. Um, the Enforcement Unit um, of the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, CITES, Secretariat. He's the coordinator of IQIC and has been working since 2012 at the Secretariat of CITES to support the development and coordination of IQIC, the implementation of the IQIC strategic program and the development of the IQIC Vision 2030. He was previously based in Thailand where he worked for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC, the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, and Traffic, Southeast Asia, and was involved in key regional initiatives and projects to increase cooperation and strengthen the capacity of government and law enforcement to counter illegal trade in wildlife. He holds a PhD from the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom, on the effectiveness of international cooperation to combat transnational organized crime, with a focus on the illegal wildlife trade in Southeast Asia, as well as a master's degree in international criminology and a degree in international relations with French. So over to you, Vanash. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, sorry, apologies. There seems to be an error with the, the presentation. Could you please use the PDF? Um if possible. Yeah, it's going to be a bit cryptic to, to follow on the slides, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry, um, please bear with us for, for two seconds, if that's OK. Sure. If you would like, we could ask our other speaker to make a few remarks in the meantime, and that will give you a chance to sort that out. I, I, I know the distress of having a... <laughs> okay. So I think then what I will do is um, I will introduce to you um, Ms. Tebatso Future Baleseng, who is the Deputy Head of Mission at the Embassy of Botswana in Brussels, and the mission to the European Union since August 2019. The embassy is accredited to the Kingdom of Belgium, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, and the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Um, she has over 24 years of professional experience in the Botswana government and the Foreign Service. She holds a postgraduate diploma in digital business from Emeritus with coursework from the Columbia Business School and, the M and MIT, a Global Master of Arts, an Executive Master of Leadership in Global Affairs from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy um, from Tufts at Tufts University, and a Bachelor of Arts in Social Sciences, Political Science and Public Administration from the University of Botswana. So I'm going to invite her to share a few remarks from another range state uh, developing country's perspective. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. And thank, to, thank you to MEP Saliba for organizing these consultations. And I'm happy to engage on what Botswana has put in place to address poaching and illegal wildlife trade in the country. I would like to start by stating that Botswana condemns illegal wildlife trading in all forms and manifestations. Additionally, as has been stated by the ambassador of Tanzania, Botswana has one of the highest conservation land ratios in Africa, with more than 25% of the land area set aside for, from parks and reserves to conserve heritage and well-being. We have, however, witnessed uh, misinformation campaigns on poaching in Botswana, including claims that the government of Botswana is not working well with 
is not working well with other range states in managing rhino poaching, and that the government does not share information with non-state actors. Regrettably, these misleading claims are made by people with little understanding on what is happening in the country, yet they had not engaged the government to establish the facts. I hope that these meetings will serve to dispel some of the misinformation that has been put around. But I'll quickly run through um, two points mainly. Um, the Botswana rhino poaching trends and response measures in place to counter poaching. Even though the dramatic surge in organized rhino poaching in the region has been ongoing for decades, Botswana was spurred until 2018 when organized rhino poaching eventually hit the country. This increase in rhino poaching in Botswana coincided with a decline in rhino poaching in the region. In terms of statistics, you'll find that between 2012 and 2017, only two rhinos had been poached. And um, between 2018 and 2022, the number then stands at 138. In terms of response measures to counter poaching and illegal wildlife trade in the country, the government and its non-state collaborators have adopted several measures to mitigate poaching threats and illegal wildlife trade. Some of these include the Botswana National Elephant Management Plan 2021 to 2026. Here there are six strategic objectives of the plan, including focusing on combating poaching and illegal wildlife trade related to elephants. These have a deliberate multi-stakeholder plan to combat wild, illegal wildlife trade of elephants and elephant products. There's also a rhino conservation strategy that was adopted in 2005, and the Botswana Rhino Management Committees established in the same year. The overall purpose of the committee is to advise the Director of Wildlife and National Parks on all issues related to rhino conservation in the country, including measures to combat illegal trade in rhino horn. The National Conservation Strategy was further revised in 2011, but it then adopted in 2013. It is also under review for the period 2023 to 2028 and will address the shortcomings um, experience in the previous 2013 strategy. It is go, go undergoing extensive um, stakeholder consultations and it, it is scheduled to be launched by August 2023. Pangolion remains one of the most widely trafficked species in Botswana. A Pangolion conservation and management plan is currently under development as well. Similarly, standards operational procedures for how to deal with recovered live Pangolion have been drafted to provide guidance on law enforcement agencies and judiciary officials on how to deal with cases as they arise. The government of Botswana has deployed a large contingent of um, forces into areas susceptible to poaching and illegal wildlife trade, including in private reserves and game forms to support the Department of Wildlife and National Parks and private game ranches to poaching and um, by armed and highly organized criminal gangs. Similarly, the police and state intelligence are involved in counter poaching operations in order to augment what the Department of Wildlife and National Parks efforts to combat wildlife crime. A national anti poaching strategy provides, among others, standard operational procedures that govern interagency relationships. So there is clarity on how law enforcement agencies work together on anti-poaching and illegal wildlife trade. Government has enhanced interagency collaboration such that all law enforcement agencies and Department of Wildlife and National Parks work together to deal with poaching. Interagency committees have been established at both national and district levels, and they meet weekly in order to share intelligence 
and other crucial operational information and also to plan and implement law enforcement operations together. And we have been engaging all neighbors through joint permanent commissions on defense and security structures chaired by cabinet ministers of the respective countries. Most of the JPCDs have since been elevated to binational commissions chaired at head of state level. Wildlife crime, most of which is transnational, is one of the major thematic areas covered by these commissions. Resolutions on commitments during these meetings are implemented at district level, especially joint border patrol, joint investigation, shared sharing of intelligence, and conduct of joint synchronized transboundary law enforcement operation. Botswana also has memorandums of understanding with its neighboring countries relating to wildlife management and wildlife crimes. Over and above the bilateral structures, we have an active, we are an active member of a number of regional and international structures meant to build collaborative relationships with other regional states to combat transnational wildlife crime and illegal wildlife trade. This includes the SADC, Rhino, Interpol, Rhino, and Elephant Security Group, Interpol Wildlife Crime Working Group, Gavango Zambezi Transfer Frontier Conservation Area, Safety and Security Group, among others. Through these platforms, Botswana coordinates its anti poaching operations and illegal wildlife trade with those of its neighbors, such as, for example, epitomized by implementation of the SADC Law Enforcement and Action Plan, which has further been cascaded for implementation within the Kaza TFCA landscape by Angola, Botswana, Namibia, and Zimbabwe. A key response has been the development of a national anti-poaching strategy, developed in 2018, updated in 2022. The, as a result of law enforcement agencies started working together in all spheres of wildlife crime and illegal wildlife trade, including joint planning and execution of intelligence-led operation. Strategic government-private partnerships and international cooperating pa partners also have played a part in this area. The government of Botswana has built strategic partnerships with other organizations, including private sector and international cooperating partners, such as the United Nations and the United Nations on Office on Drugs and Crime, Interpol, amongst others. These strategic partnerships have enhanced transnational and regional cooperation on efforts to combat wildlife crime and illegal wildlife trade. As a result, a number of international as well as regional operations aimed at combating wildlife crime have been carried out by the country. And the government of Botswana took a decision to dehorn all rhinos in in the wild and in an effort to reduce their appeal to poachers and subsequently discourage poachers from traveling to the country for hornless animals. Similarly, owners of private sanctuaries housing rhinos are being encouraged to dehorn their animals. Botswana keeps its ivory and rhino horns in a strong room that is well secured to prevent leakages into the illegal markets. Live rhino and rhino specimen are not traded at all in Botswana. Effort geared towards combating wildlife crime have been intensified across the country through targeted regional operations. Use of detection docks as strategic points, including ports of entry and exit. These involve interagency collaborating partners, including the Aviation Authority and other border control. Um, the Department of Wildlife and National Parks has a community support and outreach division whose functions, among others, include publication of awareness raising materials and engaging members of the public where large groups of people congregate. These platforms used to raise public awareness on poaching and illegal wildlife trade as well as other issues of interest in wildlife. In conclusion, it is 
noteworthy to underscore that there's a significant decline in rhino and elephant poaching incidences. This decline is a direct result of the government response in the form of various interventions, including those summarized above. Misguided calls by some NGOs calling for each of the interventions to be evacuated and evaluated in isolation, such as whether the honing by itself kept poaching, as well as linking poaching to legal trophy hunts are misleading and divert attention from the key indicator that matters, which is whether overall poaching is decreasing or increasing. It is clear that conservation and anti-poaching efforts have been intensified to combat poaching across the country, and there is explicit evidence of a decline in rhino and elephant poaching. These measures are being implemented through a combination of government-only programs, public-private community partnerships, and through the support of international cooperating partners who have all committed substantial resources to intensify anti-poaching measures. Botswana has intentions to maintain the current decline until it reaches negligible levels, working with agencies that genuinely do want to lend assistance. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Edward to continue with his presentation. Thank, thank you, Chair. And actually, it's... Um, it's great this happened because then we get to hear from the parties directly and then, then uh, I can come in and supplement because I think they've, they've talked a, a lot. What, um, what I'd like to do is first um, do a, a, a quick uh, talk about uh, CITES, about iQuick, and then put it in the framework of the, um, of the action plan and the discussion that we're having here. Um, so you'll probably know most of this and a lot of it have been done. Uh, I won't go necessarily into detail just to to not miss anybody. And I think um, a lot of this information has already been discussed. But in case uh, somebody's not aware, uh, CITES is, is the convention regulating international trade. At the last COP, uh, with the changes in the appendices, uh, there's now a total of over 40,000 species, a lot of new ones uh, that were adopted at COP that um, came into place recently. And the convention is used uh, to, uh, the main purpose of the convention is to facilitate trade, make sure it's legal, sustainable and travel. And it's also a mechanism that's used for combating illegal trade. Now, it's already been mentioned um, what happened at COP, so I won't go into it, but just to mention there was an, 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 a great number of decisions that were adopted and a lot that are actually relevant to the discussion today and in particular to, to the, the action plan as well. And I'll touch a bit on those uh, in a moment. Um, before I go into that, just to mention what iQuick is. For those that might not be aware, iQuick is the International Consortium on Combating Wildlife Crime. And it's basically uh, a partnership, a consortium between those five organizations you see below, CITES Secretariat, Interpol, UNODC, the World Bank, and the WCO, to provide coordinated support to countries to combat wildlife crime across the criminal justice chain. I think the discussion here focuses a lot on, uh, on the local aspects. IQIC is more working at the regional international aspects, uh, hence the, the consortium. And again, we have a, a major program, so I would like to thank, use the opportunity to thank the European Union and various EU member states for the continued support since the creation of IQIC in 2010. Bringing it back to the discussion, I think um, the, the four priorities have been mentioned already. I won't go into it necessarily. Um, what I'd like to focus perhaps a little bit the discussion is going into the CITES context. Um, and again, some of it might be a bit repetitive because um, our, our, the previous speakers um, have already touched on, on a few elements that are under the CITES processes. Um, I'd also like to touch on the other elements of the action plan because that's where really iQuick comes in. Uh, so first we'll go into the first priority. And again, I think most of this has been said. We know the damage of illegal trade. 
we know the problems that it poses not only to communities, to livelihoods, to the ecosystems, to the surrounding environment of wildlife and to the people that depend on it. CITES, the whole point of CITES is to make sure that when there's well-regulated legal trade, it can be beneficial. And the communities are really one of those actors that can really benefit, benefit from legal, sustainable and traceable trade inside Ulysses pictures, but also in terms of combating wildlife crime, they play a crucial part because they, by protecting the wildlife, they can mitigate the crimes and they can also uh, positively affect the human wildlife conflict, which as we know, it's a, it's a major issue in many countries across the world. There's a lot of success stories and a lot of work that's currently on the way. Um, the problem is that there's not sufficient information out there of what's working, what's not working, how can we do better? And I think there's a, there's a lot of ongoing CITES processes, for example, that are asking parties to give us information about um, what type of conservation, what type of involvement of your local communities, how are you working? I think the ambassador mentioned before uh, Vicuña, that's one of perhaps 20 or 30 success stories that are out there that would be quite useful to know. And I think there's perhaps a little bit of a gap of information uh, on where, what the benefits of all this is. So one of the recommendations uh, would be that really the communities are, are, integral, uh, are made an integral, integral part of the CITES processes because with their feedback, you can make sure that the countries go to COP and where those decisions get made, uh, those uh, aspects are taken into account. Now, the communities are an important role player. Um, that we've been talking about the, the role that they have at the front lines and the ongoing efforts and the, and the CITES, but I'd like to make a bit of a distinction, um, a distinction between what could be a bit of poaching or, or some, some activity where some animals might be affected, other aspects related to human wildlife conflict and the problem that that poses. But I'd like to bring it to a third element, which is perhaps what brings me into the next part of the discussion, but I quick is when you involve organized crime. Now, organized crime is, is, is there in wildlife and it's not uh, something that any country or, or community can deal alone. It requires a concerted effort. And that's actually one of the reasons why IQIC was created back in the day, to make sure that we provide uh, coordinated support across the law enforcement trade, across the criminal justice chain, to make sure that you don't only detect and seize those, uh, those cases when the wildlife is, um, is killed uh, or traded illegally, but you also ultimately dismantle the criminal uh, syndicates that are behind the trade. So what we work on here is where it links to all the other focus areas uh, of the, sorry, not focus area, priorities of the EU action plan. It's really across the criminal justice chain to make sure that there's preemptive work to, de to <coughs> deter the crime before it happens. And I think that will be an important role of communities. Although I have to say that ICWI doesn't work necessarily directly with the communities per se, because the nature of the consortium is international organizations, are you working at anything that's international? Uh, but then working throughout the criminal justice chain with police, customs, enforcement, everybody, investigators, prosecutors, to make sure those criminals are really brought to justice. How do we do that? Um, it's actually not rocket science. Uh, what's, what tends to happen is that the interventions are based on needs. And for that, I quick developed uh, basically tools that are, that are done to do assessments. So in the top, uh, top of your screen, you see three different types of assessments that are done. The toolkit, the indicator framework, and the WEN guidelines that are basically designed to do an assessment of what's happening in the country, what's, what's the capacity of the law enforcement to combat it, and the same at the, at the regional level and how those efforts can be enhanced to do it. And then before uh, other colleagues mentioned the importance of, of basing the information based on data. There's data such as that produced based on the annual illegal trade reports that parties produce that guides the information and helps UNODC, the support from ICRIC produce the World Wildlife Crime Report. Now, if you have not seen that report, I'd highly recommend it. Um, and then 
again, when there's um, key priorities identified, there's tools that are developed based on decisions or based on needs identified. For example, one of the priorities in the action plan is on combating wildlife crime linked to the internet. This is a tool that can help parties investigate this. And I'll use the, the opportunity also to mention the, the biannual report that was just launched uh, a few weeks ago that includes a lot of detail of what iQuick is doing, if you want to know more. I'd like to quickly touch in terms of real case scenarios, what's actually happened, what's the impact that we're having. If we're looking at major issues that were perhaps uh, not discussed or actively tackled in the past, we're talking about corruption, prosecution or the lack of, and then what happens with the, with the cases, what happens after the seizures. So if you look at corruption, for example, about 10 years ago, not a lot of people were looking at corruption. Some people were working on that. Through the last uh, four, six years of investment, there's a number of prevention tools that have been developed and the impact is clear. Kenya, for example, over the course of the last three, four years, has achieved 100% a score on the, on the anti-corruption performance indicator. This basically means that through support provided, they, they now have implemented basically most of the things that they can implement to mitigate or avoid corruption. That's a huge step and something that would like to be replicated in the future. Prosecutions, again, something that didn't happen a lot in the past. To be honest, there's still a big gap that needs to be uh, tackled there, but it's something that, uh, that I quick is supportive and actively working with to make sure that those, those cases get turned into prosecutions and convictions to make sure that those criminals involved again are brought to justice. In terms of law enforcement cooperation, which is, I guess, the, the core of iQuick's work. Um, before there used to be a seizure, I used to be based in, in, in Thailand, and the amount of times I went to, to talk to the police and they took a photo of the case, they put it in the newspaper and that's it. Not even a case developed, a case closed. Now you're really seeing a trend where through support provided, and there's a number of platforms that uh, that are provided, uh, there's active investigations that are being taken place. For example, when countries come to meetings now, uh, they're not really just let there to have a meeting. There's a, in the screen you see there's something called a wire, wildlife interregional enforcement meeting. At that meeting, basically, countries from across the world come together, and during those meetings, there's bilaterals that are facilitated. During the course of a, a one-week meeting, there was 50 cases or 50 bilaterals that were in, that were facilitated between countries to discuss actual cases. Bring them together, talk about a target, move on, continue the investigations later. So things like that is is um, the support that we want to provide. And again, thunder uh, is probably something that everybody, or hopefully most of you, have heard of. Is the flagship uh, global operation supported by iQuick. Um, Lots of seizures. I think the, the, the point I'd like to make there is that during the operations, there's a number of suspects that were identified. The last one had 934. And what happens in those cases is that those cases get followed up. There's a link that gets made between a case here, a case there. There's ongoing investigations that happen here and there. And this is a case, for example, that was detected where there was six separate incidents of illegal trade going from Angola to Vietnam where the authorities had detected it individually, but they had not put the pieces together. Putting those pieces together helped them make a significant seizure um, and continue investigations onto high level uh, targets. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time and the, the invitation. Thank you very much, Edward. So we heard some really interesting perspectives there. Um, on the one side, we have a very sophisticated um, global initiative and attempt to, to uh, address international organized crime. On the other hand, we have the realities in developing countries that have done a good job of conserving their wildlife, um, have understood the need to involve and benefit local communities, and are very concerned about markets getting further markets getting shut down, perhaps leading then to further um, insurgency, rebellion, poaching, et cetera, um, and adversely affecting local communities. So 
it seems what is needed is a nuanced policy that strikes the balance between ferreting out the illegal activity, but at the same time enabling sustainable legal trade to happen where it needs to happen, both for the benefit of local communities and ultimately for the benefit of conservation, because if the communities are not on board, conservation will, will suffer. So with that brief background, um, I'd like to invite any further interventions or, or comments or questions from the floor. Gentlemen over there. I'm Peter Fiocchi, I'm a MEP here. Uh, I have worked and of course I hunted in uh, Namibia and I found a uh, extremely interesting how the system works very well with the local communities because once you give uh, value to wildlife through trophy hunting, uh, then uh, it's interesting to protect this wildlife. Uh, before I was maybe a danger or a nuisance or a damage to your agricultural farm, uh, and now suddenly it's a source of income. So uh, that was, in my opinion, very effective in some area of uh, Namibia uh, to uh, lower, in a sense, the way the, uh, the local poaching. I'm not talking about the international one, okay? Uh, I have a question which is very interesting in your answer because uh, some of the discussion we had uh, during this time was a very controversial proposal, I believe, by the South African government, which was basically saying that we are... Uh, sitting on uh, hundreds of tons of uh, uh, elephant tusk and uh, rhino horns uh, confiscated to criminals, why don't we put them on the market at a very low price, making the criminal activity not so <laughs> interesting anymore? But I found a lot of controversy on that, but I'm, I'm not so knowledgeable to give an answer to that. So if you, if you can explain to me your position, I will be uh, very grateful. Thank you. Would our colleagues from Tanzania or Botswana like to respond? Uh, thank you. I, I, I didn't get you very well. What uh, you are you are you said about South Africa? Then uh, there's not such a push for the criminal organization to hire people, uh, helicopters, pilots, and everything else, risk their life to kill a rhino and take away the horn. So this was uh, one of the discussions we had, but I, it never went uh, anywhere. So I, I don't know if it was real or... <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so thank you. I don't speak on behalf of South Africa. Maybe <laughs> there is a representative of South Africa here. Maybe she would like to to respond, if that's the case, really. Uh, yeah. Do go ahead. Thank you very much, Ambassador and, and the moderator. Uh, I don't think that I'm immediately in a position to, to respond to, 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 to a, an issue like that, especially if there's no certainty about what exactly was, was being said about, about selling, um, you know, rhino horn at a, at a lower price um, when, when it would be expensive elsewhere. So I, I'd much rather not, not really comment on, on that um, until we're certain uh, what we're talking about. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, not, maybe some elements of um, historical background. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly this is referred to, but uh, years ago, um, the CITES parties agreed uh, one sale, a one-off sale of uh, ivory in that case. Uh, I think it was limited to ivory uh, with the idea of, um, of having some legal trade that would uh, replace the illegal trade and that it would uh, kill basically the illegal trade because there was legal trade in the market. But and frankly, I think uh, generally the, uh, 
the assessment that has been done of that experience is um, is quite negative, actually. It is um, quite negative because the feedback that uh, that we got as parties to CITES is that this stimulated demand and didn't make any any harm to illegal trade. Quite the contrary, it was um, uh, somehow stimulated and we saw some of the peak on on poaching on illegal trade after that, after those, uh, those decisions. At the moment, certainly the EU and its member states are clearly against any opening of trade on rhino horns or ivory. We are actually going the opposite direction, tightening our rules uh, further. We have a couple of years ago uh, adopted a, a new guidance on um, on ivory, uh, which tightens up uh, quite significantly the, the, the trade, the same with uh, rhino. So we don't think that this is a, a solution. Uh, I think we have to find uh, ways to support uh, uh, range uh, states in their, in their fight against illegal trade, but not by opening uh, trade of, uh, of uh, highly endangered uh, species. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. I'm, I'm just going to um, also abuse my position as moderator here because this is an area of, of my expertise as, a, as an economist on, on those particular commodities. Just to say your specific question was about dumping the products on the market at a very low price. And my response to that is that that is not a good idea because typically what happens in a scenario like that is the, um, the product then gets bought up by speculators who then will tend to sit on it and then drip, drip, drip feed it in the market. So typically the, benef the beneficiaries of that kind of policy are speculators. If trade were to work, you would want it to be continued on a sustained basis at a fair price, cutting out the middleman. That is in, in fact also where those one-off sales failed is because they, they didn't do that. They created a lot of profit in the middle um, what you should be doing is getting the maximum possible price for the supplier and the minimum possible price to the consumer and cut out the middle completely. If you inflate the middle, then nobody benefits um, because your, your, your fl flow of funds back into conservation is low, but the consumer price is still higher, which sends out a signal to the marketplace to continue poaching and illegal activity. So I hope, I hope that's helpful. Would you like to, um, my colleague from... Thank, thank you, thank you, Mike. Uh, Michael, I would like just to echo that uh, economic principle that you have just elaborated. It is natural that if you kill a legal trade, you pave a way for a legal one. And this has to be taken into board by this August Assembly, that if we talk about killing the legal trade on wildlife animals in a way will be paving ways for more illegal wildlife trading. So it's better you do trading which is more regulated, more monitored, more observed uh, under, under rules and under, under, under laws and under policy rather than saying we want to put a blank, a blank ban in everything, then you pave ways for illegal trading to happen. And the poaching will come back in a very high ways. This is our appeal, that please don't do anything with something which is legal. Do something for something which is illegal. And we are all in on the same platform that we should fight any illegal wildlife trafficking. But touching the legal one is paving way for the illegal to take place. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Gentlemen across the way. Ambassador, it was very interesting what you explained the last two, three sentences, but is that the position of all the African countries? Uh, Ambassador, th no, thank you, Honorable. We ambassadors, we speak on behalf of our countries. I'm speaking on behalf of Tanzania. <clears throat> That's a pity. 
it's a complicated position for the Commission and even for European Parliament. May I just quickly say that we share the same sentiments that have been expressed by the Ambassador of Tanzania. Thank you. And may I also say, Excellency, that uh, same sentiments was also presented, if I may recall, I think this was on, uh, we presented all SADC ambassadors in Brussels. I mean, ambassador of Tanzania, Botswana, Namibia, uh, Angola, uh, Mozambique, uh, Mauritius, Seychelles, DRC, uh, and South Africa, uh, Eswatini, uh, Namibia, Zimbabwe. We all presented that concern to the EU. I think it was through a letter which we wrote, and we presented these issues all together. I would like also, if you don't mind, let on I can share with you all those pet issues that we presented to the EU to be considered as you are discussing this agenda. Thank you. We have a comment from the EU. <laughs> from the Commission. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the. The, the question is a very relevant one because indeed, indeed there are different models of conservation on how to develop uh, um, sustainable management of wildlife and um, there are different models in Africa and uh, we see this every time we meet in CITES and it's very controversial within Africa because there are different models. From the EU we are I think approaching this with a, in a balanced way, trying to help each country to take its decisions to uh, how best they go about, uh, about conservation. And now that I take, uh, I have the, the word, I, I would like to, well, mention that I don't think that 1.5 billion, which is the budget of Natural Africa, is a small money. I, I think it's quite a lot of money, but Africa is very big. <laughs> And the needs are very high. So it's very important that also, uh, as you very well explained, uh, Excellency, that the countries, uh, the range states, take their responsibility to also raise uh, domestic resources to, uh, for conservation. We are, um, we are there to help and to cooperate and to establish partnerships that are uh, good for conservation and sustainable development. And we have a number of programs uh, that are taking action in, in, uh, in, in cooperation with range states across Africa. Um, but I just want to, to highlight there are uh, different models and different uh, solutions that are taken uh, taking, uh, forward by, by the countries and, and we are trying to accompany these efforts and support uh, them in their, in their, uh, in their actions uh, in, uh, in, in conservation and, and sustainable development. Thank you very much for those comments. Are there any further comments or questions? Yes. Um, we've talked a lot, I think, about um, what I would call the uh, sort of prevention of the supply or supply prevention, but of course the other side of the equation is demand. And so um, I'm curious to know, you know, what your collective experiences are with uh, reduction of demand from the, the perhaps the, the parties who aren't or the, the, the side of the equation who really isn't represented here. And um, you know, whether there are effective means of, of reducing demand and not really putting um, all of this on the uh, African range states or, or the, the range states that have the wildlife and, and recognizing, of course, that without demand, um, you know, there would be no perhaps need for the supply from, from the range states. I'm not sure anyone here. I, I didn't direct. A... I didn't direct that at anyone in particular. Um, I, I'm also not sure anyone here is really in a position to respond to that. Well, if, for, but but for example, if if the EU, um, you know, if if the action plan, um, you know, 
will will also address an engagement with the with the demand side as well. Yes, thanks very much. Actually, it's the first priority of the action plan is to promote the effective implementation of CITES resolution on demand reduction strategies to combat illegal trade. This list of the species. And uh, we are doing a number of actions um, and we are about to, to launch um, a, a, a project that was actually requested by the European Parliament, a pilot project, to investigate uh, the issue of demand reduction, mainly in the EU, as regards exotic pets and uh, the main, well, the main uh, uh, species that are, or types of species that are uh, on demand in the EU. But we have also engaged internationally in demand reduction uh, projects uh, for illegally traded species in China, for example. Uh, we have had a, a, a project and there are cons uh, conversations ongoing. I mean, this is just off, off the top of my head. I mean, there are a, a number of actions uh, on, on demand uh, uh, reduction on, on illegal trade to understand where the, the, what is driven the demand and try to work on that basis as well. Thank you. Edward. Thank you, Chair. And, and first, let me start by saying I'm by no means an expert in demand reduction, uh, quite far from it, actually. Um, but there is on the side is uh, some some decisions uh, that are linked to efforts to reduce the, the demand for illegally traded species. And there's a number of uh, things that have happened. There's, there's a guidance on demand reduction strategies to combat illegal trade that was developed and that was, uh, I think, made available to parties. Uh, they all can access it and it's been translated, I believe, into other languages now. And there's a number of decisions uh, where the secretary is going to, with a number of partners, um, do some regional training seminars and pilot projects to promote the use of this guidance uh, for selected species and countries. So that's there's a number of uh, efforts underway related to demand reduction for illegally traded species uh, that perhaps might be of interest to follow. And this work will be um, conducted over the interstitial period and reported upon to the next COP. So something to perhaps keep in, in mind of. And while I have the floor, um, just to quickly mention in terms of resources, uh, something that the countries might want to um, look at in particular is the, the GEF. There's a new cycle of uh, funding under the GEF that is something that the Secretariat actively encourages parties to, to seek support. I believe there's the new phase of the, the new project that they're doing, um, and I forget the full name, apologies for that, but it's, it's, um, it's integrating projects based on the national priorities of, of, uh, of countries. It's a competitive selection process, and I believe most of the process has already been uh, completed at this stage, but um, the GEF is proving to be a strong partner to, uh, to parties in support of their efforts. Um, the, the previous phase, had a number of countries, now that number of countries has nearly doubled, and there's surely going to be a, a third phase. So uh, from the party side, it's, it's something that you could actively consider to, to engage, uh, talk to your, um, to your national GEF focal points. They can give you guidance. If you don't know um, uh, how to do that, we can put you in contact with our colleagues at the bank that are, are coordinating the new global program that can provide guidance. I think Perhaps the, the process now has already been been initiated, so it might be a bit late to, for this current cycle, but looking forward, it might be something of interest. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I think these are the issues that also need to be well addressed, uh, looking at the demand sides and the supply side. But when you look at that, uh, the equation, I don't have the current data, but if you allow me to use a data of uh, 2015, uh, for, 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 a, for a period of about 10 years, uh, 24 to 2015, there was a demand of around 1.7 million hunting trophies globally. 
1.7 million hunting trophies globally. And out of that, only 200,000 were seen and regarded as uh, threatening the, the process, the, 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 the endangered species. So if you put that balance, if you have 1.7 and only 200,000 are found being illegally or not well uh, regulated to be part of endangered, then what a decision are you making? Are you banning everything? Saying, okay, we ban everything out of 1.7 million because we have got 200,000. I think there is a need to be well balanced on the equation of the problem. That's why we are saying we should make any blanket ban. Let's deal with the problem as it comes and let's deal with the reality as it comes. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions or comments? Um, I have a question on trophy hunting. Um, I was wondering if you could give us some examples of um, how uh, the benefits that are generated from trophy hunting are equitably distributed between the different players. So it could be tour operators, uh, state authorities, and local communities. And do you have examples of when the benefits may not have reached the local communities um, and what can be done to make sure it does? Uh, thank you. Let me just uh, put an example. Thank you for the question. Uh, for the case of Tanzania, for example, uh, in 2010 until 2020, we managed to have around 4 million US dollar that was dispersed to our local community. And this was, you know, in Tanzania, we have something we call community wildlife management. Community wildlife management. And this community wildlife management, they have to get some money, some funds from the government, from the revenue that are generated from the trophy hunting. So you could see 4 million US dollar in that small uh, uh, specific period of time. But uh, as I told you before, we have distributed more than 139 million US dollar for a span of 10 years that has gone to the community. We are very thankful for the, for the program initiative from the EU on natural Africa. But uh, to tell the truth, the amount is 1.5 billion. Yeah, of course, some figures, they show that there are three, 310 million. That's the one which is going to be working in a Congo Basin per se. Uh, so so three, three, 310 million, uh, for a period of six years, 2021, 2027, if you put in by average, it's just about 51 million per year. 51 million per year for Africa, <laughs> it's too small. You cannot say you are going to create jobs. So this is what we are saying, honorable uh, MPs, that if you, you put the blanket ban of the hunting trophies, meaning we are going to lose a lot of jobs to our young people, meaning we are going to lose. We have a community of Maasai's, you have no, they are completely life is depending on the hunting trophies. And we are very thankful for our uh, partners from the European Union. You have been so help, helping in providing some fund from Germany, from Sweden, Finland, a number of countries, you are working hand to hand in Tanzania to make more conservation. We need to have the sustainability of this. If I may just pick up on one aspect of the question that was yes. of interest, I think, was um, it, is there a way this could be improved, for example, by further strengthening community ownership rights or something like that to ensure that greater benefits flow to the communities? Because I think there are often concerns that a lot of the money 
um, is taken by outfitters, but not not enough goes to local people. And perhaps you have some comments about that. Yeah, speaking on Tanzania, I want to, and this is something which is, I think is wrongly said, thinking maybe the, 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 the hunting trophy hunters are getting more benefits. You know, hunters, their, their, their pleasure is just the hunting. The hunting is the pleasure. And it's the hunting that gives them pleasure. If you give them an animal which is killed, they will not take it. Give them the lion, which is dead already. They will not be happy to take that lion and take all of that lion because that's give them a pleasure. The hunting itself is a pleasure. And there is human, you know, even within the bush, there are hunters and the hunting. There are wild animals which are hunting and there are wild animals which are hunter. So <clears throat> what we are coming back to your, your question, the big part of this community, the share, like what we have said, we have because we don't we want to know how much share goes to the community. So that's why we have a community wildlife management. We know how much has come, we know how much percentage they need to make conservation more sustainable. That is on one part. But on the other part, we have seen, for example, in Tanzania recently, because we have been protecting animals and uh, so animals are increasing by nature. For example, we have noted that within a period of few years, uh, period of like two or three, five years, the number of elephants have increased from 45,000 to 65,000. So an increase, an increment of almost 20,000 elephants. And what does that imply? What does that explain? The eco coexistence, the harmony coexistence between human and the elephants and the wild animal is becoming more in danger. What we have seen now, the elephants are hunting now people in the local communities. They cannot put on their activities because there are big increase of elephants around. So the elephants are now killing people. For example, in our system, we have a, 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 a percentage of the consulting that we have to give for people who have been killed by animal, by wild animal. For example, in, in just five years, the amount that government has spent is almost three million US dollar for consolation, three million US dollar. And this is a peanut because what we are giving, what we are giving is not more than almost 1,000 US euro, less than 1,000 euro for a person who has been killed by elephants. So when you are talking about three million, then you may think how many people have been killed. There should be a way so if, if we say we are going to stop everything, then means these people, the ecosystem, you know, the ecosystem is not going to balance. The animals, are, uh, wildlife are increasing. So when they're increasing, there should be a way of trying to have, to have a balance so that there could be an eco-existence. I think I'm understood on that part. Yes, gentlemen across the room. Thank you. My name is Toby Lorton. I'm the president of FACE. Uh, in our organization, we have 37 nations, European nations as members, and we've been talking a lot about uh, acceptance of hunting in society. And we have also a strategic plan for that, how to high, have a high acceptance in the society. How is it, I mean, Mr. Ambassador in Tanzania, for example, acceptance of hunting in local communities or could you develop that a little do you measure that uh, and maybe overall as well do you see it as important hunting in uh, 
hunting in uh, the acceptance of hunting in 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 uh, local communities or in general thank you there is a big high level of acceptance of the hunting in the local community high level and to them you know most of the local community especially those who are living in uh, surrounding areas of where hunting is happening uh, as i said they regard hunting as the life to them hunting is life so if you stop hunting you are violating their human rights because they depend on hunting on everything from a to z the other thing which is also uh, well regarded in this circumstance, we do have hunting blocks. And uh, these hunting blocks, they are becoming like a, a ecosystem, a places that keep making the environment more friendly. If you take away those blocks, it means you are allowing other poachers to come in because the hunters, they are given a block and they are defending and protecting those blocks from against the hunters. So we are using hunt, uh, the owners of the block as a, as a way of fighting against poaching as well. So if you take, again, you take away those blocking, hunting blocks, it means you are making poachers closer to the community. And this is not something which they are welcoming. So to say, in a short, the hunting is so much welcomed by our community. They've lived in that process, and they love that process, and they enjoy every revenue that is generated from the hunting. Against that, it's a violation of their human rights. And this is what they are telling us. May I comment on that as well? And just say that um, in the case of Botswana as well, we've seen that acceptance um, is, is quite high because it is seen as a way of um, controlling wildlife populations, especially in incidences where there's human wildlife conflict. And um, overall, especially in, in the past, I think between 2012, if I'm not mistaken, there was a total ban of... Um, hunting in Botswana at some point. And there were growing concerns, especially in the communities where uh, there was a lot of uh, incidences of human wildlife conflict, of um, the animals going into places, growing, the animal populations growing so much that they are going into places where people live. And sometimes I'm taking the lives of people. So I think it is something that is part of, has been part of um, traditional practice in Botswana. It is embedded in the local communities, but as um, there's continuous I think improvement, education, capacity, and awareness raising within the communities to ensure, especially um, in um, particularly for threatened species and endangered species, to ensure that um, as the hunting um, con carries on, there is a balance to ensure that um, they do not get um, completely extinct. Thank you. Hi, um, Ms. Balasang, I've got a quick question for you, please. You've made reference that there is a national anti-poaching strategy in place. And I've been wondering how, if, if there's been an, a focus on wildlife forensic science or an increasing focus on wildlife forensic science being applied through that strategy. I may not be able to adequately answer your question. Um, but what I know is that um, through the strategy, the field officers in Botswana have been trained on forensic 
proper presentation of evidence of cases um, sometimes in court. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Maybe let me also now speak on, uh, on SADC, Southern African, Southern, not South Africa, Southern African mm -hmm. perspectives. Uh, within the Southern Africa, we do have also a regional strategies for, for, for fighting poaching. And uh, we, have, we have recognized 18 trans frontier conservation areas uh, within the SADC area. And we have put the, some very strategic actions to make sure that we are increasing the productivity and the ecosystem and the ecological viable landscaping and the protection of these areas. So that's why we are saying uh, we should not, if EU take an action on a unilateral basis against, uh, against uh, uh, African range states, without any consultations. We have our own strategies also within the SADC. We can also decide something and say, okay, we are going to do this and do and that and do that. And this is what we don't want. This, we want to, to live as a friends who discuss together, uh, negotiate together, dialogue together, and they agreed on a, a general principles under the sites and not each, each region's make their own interventions the way they wish. We SADC, we may also sit together and they make our interventions. And they, by, by information, I think when you are talking about safaris or range states, almost 90% are from the Southern African countries. <laughs> so we have, to, we have to, to, to engage each other and they listen from each other. Thank you. I have a, someone at the back there, yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to ask the Secretariat if actually have you noticed any trends in illegal wildlife trade over the decades? Like some countries have been increased, decreased, like other species, like the, the, the wildlife trade has been increased. Would you may answer both questions then? Uh, that's a bit of an impossible question. Yes, there's definitely trends, there's definitely changes, but it's it's always shifting. I think if you look at crime, it will always evolve and move um, where it's easier. I think there's for a long time there was a lot of focus on uh, on on Asia, and the, some of those gaps were were closed, and then you saw a shift. Uh, for example, uh, countries like Thailand uh, making a lot of success uh, and a lot of great work, and then it, it shifted to to the to the left, to the right, and to the north. You know, it's it's the the criminals will will always find a way. Particularly when you're talking about organized crime, they will always find a way to do it. And I think there's if they're if if they find um that one country is making it more complicated to do then they'll shift go elsewhere i think um eastern africa was uh was particularly um under attacked by by organized crime in 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 the past and they they really significantly um made a, a massive change you have to think over the course of the last 10 years, for example, the change has been significant. It might not seem a lot, but there's a lot of um, effort that has been done, a lot of human financial resources that have been put into by the countries, a lot of human and financial resources that have been lost by the countries in this in this uh, effort. Um, so there's there's a lot of work that's been done. And as you do that, as you close the gaps, the, the criminals will, will move. I think there's in criminology, and now I'm, I'm sidetracking a little bit apologies for that but there's there's a concept of the the gatekeepers those are the the, the people that control most uh, illegal trade in commodities in particular border areas those will will move will shift they'll they'll adapt but they'll they'll facilitate and i think there's various problems um 
there's the source countries that, that have the, the commodity itself. Uh, there's the transit countries that have the accessibility to transportation. And then there's the destination countries. You have to close the, the loop across the whole process and looking at all the, the, the aspects uh, in order to actually close the gap. And I think that's a process, if you look at, you know, wildlife crime, let's say countries have been taking it seriously for the last 10, 20 years. Uh, it, there's been a massive increase in the level of engagement, level of support, the level of funding that they've received and the level of emphasis they put at the political level. Like when I was first in, in Asia, it was, this is a, when I still had hair, uh, there was a, a lot of change uh, uh, that had happened and the, the countries in themselves started to treat it as a very serious matter. Um, as you do that, it will evolve. But, you know, there's been war on drugs has been ongoing for, for how many years? And, you know, you, you close the gap here and it will continue. So, again, when you're talking about organized crime, it's it's continuously shifting, continuously evolving. And that's why the, the countries need to continuously put the, the resources. I hope that semi answers the question. I think two, perhaps uh, two things, uh, maybe uh, plugs, plugins, if I may. Uh, if you're interested, uh, I'd recommend you look at the, the World Wildlife Crime Report uh, of 2020. There's one that's going to be issued at the end of 2023 uh, or towards early 2024. So that's uh, something that I'd encourage everybody to consult. Um, and there's also, uh, I'll plug in iQuick this time, uh, the, the annual report in terms of the different activities that have been doing that might give you an idea of, of where a lot of the trends are going as well. And if I may, sorry to continue with the floor, just to answer on forensics, uh, sorry. Um, there was, uh, there's actually a lot of work that's been ongoing on forensics. Uh, there's an African forensics network. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been done to support active cases in Laos, for example. Um, so it's, it's, it's again an evolving thing. And from the society side, we highly encourage all parties to make use of it because that's the, one of the most solid ways to build a strong case is to use the forensics to make sure you can bring those those cases to court. Thank you, and I'll leave it at that, sorry. Thank you very much, Edward. Well, we are now reaching the end of our allocated time. I'm going to allow um, Mr. Romero one last comment, and then I'm going to pass back to um, Member of Parliament Saliba to make some closing remarks. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for allowing me just to, I didn't want to, to leave uh, the room without uh, talking a bit about hunting, about uh, hunting trophies, because it has been mentioned uh, quite uh, quite a lot during 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 our our meeting here today, and I think very um, eloquently, His Excellency the Ambassador explained how this is used as a tool uh, in Tanzania. I think I just want to uh, to to recall uh, what has been uh, the EU position uh, on on this uh, over the years. I think uh, we recognize that some countries in Africa use uh, well managed trophy hunting as part of a a package of conservation. Uh, uh, tools and this can, if well managed and well organized, can provide benefits to local communities. And here from the EU, we have been following uh, a very, uh, uh, very clear approach in in having a scientific scrutiny on all the imports that we have of uh, trophy hunting. We have um, we have a scientific review group that uh, brings together all the scientific authorities all the, of EU member states, and they look at the legality, sustainability of all the uh, imports of uh, trophy uh, of trophies in, into the EU. We have, therefore, uh, country species combinations, opinions on certain country species combinations. We have some positive, but we have many negatives. There are no imports of many species for certain countries because it is uh, this legality and, and sustainability is not ensured. Uh, so this way, and also by ensuring that uh, that uh, local that there are schemes that local communities benefit from, and we try to uh, to to uh, implement uh, the the agreements also at uh, at CITES level. Just to say that from the perception point of view, it was mentioned that of, uh, that in Tanzania there is a hyper positive perception or 
acceptance. But we have to realize that in Europe, this is a, a very different uh, situation. So uh, I think one of the things that we want to do in the EU action plan against wildlife trafficking is to increase scrutiny and transparency on how we deal with uh, hunting trophies. We feel that this is something that is requested that citizens and stakeholders want to know if uh, the imports that we are doing are uh, legal, sustainable, and actually benefit the local communities back in range states. And that's our commitment in the EU action plan. And that's what we are trying to, uh, to put forward with concrete proposals. We are working on this with uh, EU member states already. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellency. Last word. Thank you. Last word. I just want to reiterate by thanking you so much for listening and give us some years. And uh, I want to thank so much Mr. Saliba for the invitation and uh, Mr. Romero for uh, especially the conclusion that we have made now uh, and Mr. Michael. Allow me to, to, to conclude my last word by by just uh, taking you to one paragraph from the sites. So, uh, Edward, I will refer to the conclusion of the site meeting of, uh, it was uh, the COP17 of the sites, which was held in South Africa in 2016. There is a paragraph, a preamble paragraph of the site, which says, recognizing that well-managed and sustainable trophy hunting is consistent with and contributes to species conservation as it provides both livelihood opportunity, opportunities for rural communities and incentives for habitat conservations and generate benefits which can be invested for conservation purposes. This is what we have agreed. This is the scientific based argument from the sites in the COP16 and we have to take care of that as we move forward. Thank you very much. So dear distinguished colleagues, guests, first of all, I am really sorry that I had to leave for them uh, 20, 30 minutes, but I had a very important presentation for some votes that we are having tomorrow. Um, I'm really sorry, but I really wanted to come back again to make some conclusion, concluding remarks. First of all, thanks uh, to all the uh, panelists for this discussion uh, and for your participation in this very interesting uh, event. Combating wildlife trafficking is essential. The cooperation between international organizations and also the European Union and member states is vital. Important partners in the fight against wildlife, are, wild, wildlife crime are local communities who are being affected at many different levels by illegal wildlife trade. I am glad that the European Union is taking initiatives to combat wildlife trafficking, and I trust that the revised EU action plan together with the EU wildlife trade regulations and other related policies will respond to the current challenges in a very comprehensive way. The sustainable use of wildlife helps ecosystems. Therefore, as His Excellency the Ambassador has rightly pointed out in his concluding remarks, Trophy hunting can go, can go hand in hand with uh, conservation if done in a sustainable way. Therefore, I hope that this debate has been enlightening and it will serve as a stimulus for future discussions on wildlife trafficking, sustainable wildlife trade, and also the EU role in all of this. Before we conclude, just a small reminder that now immediately after we end this discussion we have a cocktail reception in the members while all of you are invited again before i conclude i would like to thank wholeheartedly the face secretariat for being uh, the engine behind initiatives like this one today and also promoters uh, in favor of sustainability in initiatives and also sustainable hunting thanks a lot and thanks for your participation